Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, guys. Uh, so yeah, so let, you know, obviously save the best for last. Uh, so uh, I guess what we want to do is we want to go and talk with you guys a little bit about how we go and measure trading algorithms. And uh, you know, we're gonna. So I work on the sell side, so I build trading engines, and these guys are on the buy side. So I think this will be kind of an interesting uh, kind of view from both sides. So why don't we go and start with you, Constantine? Why don't you go uh, give a small intro to what you do? Uh, thank you, Hiss. My name is Kansin Gaber. I'm from WorldQuant, and um, we're a global startup firm trading a few billion dollars a day. And my job is to optimize uh, trading across multiple regions, asset classes, PMs. So mostly measurements, flow location, interaction with guys like uh, Heath, and um, yeah, something like that. And Adrian, how about you? Hi, I'm Adrian Sisser. I'm one of the co-founders of 7A Capital. We're a quant equity stat arb firm that, you know, amongst many other algos, uses Heaths and have been uh, executing a lot of shares for quite a while now and always learning more about it. Cool. So I think what we wanted to do is we wanted, it, it makes sense to go and tell people kind of some of the style of trading because actually depending on how you trade, it's going to go and affect what you can and can't measure. So, um, so obviously, you know, the, the end goal is to go and get the best trading performance, but uh, what that is might be different to different people. So why don't you kind of give a little bit of an overview as to kind of what, like what the style and nature of the flow is at each of your uh, shops. Um, sure, let me go first. So we, we mostly trade um, longer orders over the whole day, mostly passive trading, um, could be also like multi-day orders. Uh, though on a large scale. We are a few percentage points of the market, depending on the market, ranging from 3 to 5%. And um, our job is to pretty much minimize market impact and uh, execute as efficient as possible because it's a pretty significant portion of our overall costs. And Adrian, your stuff is a little bit different. Uh, it is, and we, we just try to make sure that he had all his hair before we started trading with Morgan and he had to, uh, to figure out how to execute our orders. We do very short horizon. We, uh, we tend to think of the world in chunks that are you know, very well below an hour, uh, sometimes as short as five minutes. Uh, we think about very short-term impact. We would rather re-optimize and rebuild our portfolio often and manage sort of the scheduling side of execution ourselves. Yeah, so it actually, it ends up being kind of, although both of you guys actually care about getting the best average price, you have you know, very, a large number of very long orders, which obviously as you're waiting, as you know, as you're trading something over a long period of time, a lot of random things happen to you. And so, you know, it takes a lot of a number of orders in order to go and diversify away that volatility. On the other hand, uh, but, but mostly you've kind of chosen what you're going to do up front. And so you kind of are able to kind of define a good unit of work and then try some with me, some with someone else, some with, you know, someone else and go and compare them to see who gets the better performance. Adrian, on the other hand, because he's you know trying to go and replan things as he gets new information coming along, he doesn't have he has shorter duration things, so less random things happen to him while he's trading, so he can go and measure things more precisely. But then the interaction of his choices going and replanning things goes and means that he can't go and see the true parent order performance as well, because if he keeps changing his mind. Uh, when prices change, then that becomes a kind of a coupled, the investment decision becomes coupled with the trading. So that we'll go into a little bit of more about that later. Um, so why don't we go and talk a little bit about what you define as good? You know, so you know the, the definite. You know, so you obviously want good trading performance. Uh, you know, if, how would you go and summarize your definition of of uh, success? Let's start with Adrian. Uh, sure. So I mean, we use the sort of the benchmark of arrival mid. Uh, that's how we measure things. Um, for us, it becomes more challenging if we decide to send back to back to back to back waves, then arrival mid is, is something that's drifting up. So for us, we have, to, we have to consider what was sort of the initial point where we started executing what the arrival mid was there. It becomes a whole thing when you start to talk about simulation and how would you have affected the mid during simulation and things like that. Because you know, we measure relative to arrival mid, but we might have changed what that mid was and it becomes sort of a feedback loop. But for, for us, you know, we're, we're all, you know, we care about the total cost we pay. Um, I know some people aren't sensitive to fees or aren't sensitive to rebates and things like that. I'm sort of mystified how that's true. Um, <laughs> I, you know, for us, it's, it's the amount of money we spend to, to execute an order. Okay, 
Actually, I'm going to draw a little picture. We'll see if this ends up being a disaster or not. I've tried to draw it as big as possible. I'm pulling out my Sharpie pen. No jokes, uh, no political jokes intended. Okay, so here I have a picture. And what am I drawing here? You can be my, my billboard here. So what we're doing, as you trade, you go and push prices up. Now the problem is, is a lot of the impact that you're having as you trade happens at the beginning of an order. So that makes it very difficult for Adrian to go and assess uh, you know, what's going on because as he goes and sends, if he slices his order up into a little piece and then goes and gives me one piece and then a second piece, at the end of the first piece, the, the impact has already, a lot of the impact has already happened. So actually he has to be very, very skilled at going and understanding short term market impact dynamics. Otherwise, he won't be able to go and get a good reference price for that second follow on order. Do you want to talk about what you guys think in, at WorldQuant when it comes to measuring success? Yeah, quite similar. Pretty much looking at the all-in uh, slippage to arrival mid. Mm -hmm. And all-in, that's a very important notion. So there are usually like um, three components you can think of. One is commissions you pay to brokers. They're trying, you know, uh, some brokers are expensive for maybe good reasons. Some brokers try to give you zero commissions. But it ends to be like very small portion of your, uh, at least for us, for our uh, performance. Second part is exchange fees and rebates. As you trade on exchanges, there is also no free lunch. If NASDAQ gives you 30 mils rebate for posted orders, they probably know that you'll get it for selected, you're not gonna, gonna get the better price, so they're trying to incentivize you to do that, mm -hmm. right? So you have to be careful. Um, there are some algos that produce very high rebates. Looks like, feels good, it's just money in the pocket, but when you look at all in, performance is not that great. So it's very important to measure each individual component. And yeah. third one, which is the most crucial one, is actually the performance, which is this pure slippage to arrival. Yeah. Yeah, so actually it's, it's an interesting thing, like a rival price has been a benchmark for a very long time. I think a lot of people don't understand why that is, um, in some sense, the truest measures. Because let's step back from benchmarks and not talk about uh, it that way. Let's go and say, my goal as an investor is to go and get the best average price. So in some sense, I just care about P times Q. So I'm gonna go, so this is my, fancy benchmark, so if I want to go and get the best average price, I just want to execute, so obviously if I was being a full mathematician, I'd have an integral sign of all of these different little, like the little P's at different prices, but the, the end goal is that I want to go and execute my quantity. If I'm going to complete the whole quantity, I want to do it at the best average price. The problem is I don't know what this price is going to be, right? This, at, at the start of an order, uh, that's going to be something that's going to happen in the future. But obviously, if you go and say, the price in the future is equal to the current price right now times, and then you go and add on some alpha that happens. So, there's, so during the, over the time that I'm working some order for Adrian, prices are going to move, and some of it I'm going to understand, and I'm going to know what's going to happen, and, and some of it's going to be random. Uh, and then there's also going to be some impact that's going to be caused by my own trading. So obviously, if you remember from your kind of math course, if you have a you know, a bowl shaped, if you go and add a constant to it, you should just move it up and down. Moving something up and down doesn't change the optimal thing. It's still the same place. You just moved it up and down. So I can go and subtract off any fixed thing. This constant here, the price that's already happened is something that's already happened. It's not going to change. So if I kind of ignore that, really the only thing I have to go and uh, try and optimize is what's my view of the prices and how much will I change them. So in some sense, a person that wants to go and optimize this minus P naught, i.e. The, the rival price measure, is really just a person that's trying to go and say, given my view of how the prices are likely to evolve and how much I'll change them with my own activity, what's the best way for me to go and trade? So that's really why all these quants have kind of consolidated, I'd say like 80% of the people that I talk to kind of measure themselves relative to rival price. And we'll talk a little bit later about what the other 20% are doing uh, as well. You, want, you guys talked a little bit about um, opportunity cost and cleanup cost. So, well, I, I liked one thing you said that if I'm good, then you're happy to pay me a little bit more as long as I don't overcompensate my performance gain with uh, commissions. Uh, but the, you know, the, the end goal to people should just be to get the best dollars out of pocket, inclusive of all the fees are going to be charged. I agree with that statement. Um, can you talk a little bit about the opportunity cost and, and why that's a thing? Sure. I mean, you know, if at a certain point we want a broker to let us decide if we still want a position as opposed to crossing the spread, paying a ton of money to finish an order that's been sitting out there. 
So, uh, you know, opportunity cost for us is the fact that rather than crossing the spread and paying, you know, seven or eight bips or whatever it is for a particular stock, instead, you know, we measure what if you leave that order open? What if you don't cross the spread at the end to finish and let me reoptimize? And the opportunity cost is sitting out there and saying, you know, what does that unfilled quantity look like? Is it, is it drifting away from me? Am I losing a lot by doing that? Am I better off crossing the spread to finish up rather than leaving it out there? And, and in general, I mean, the whole, like, I guess, theme here is how to be fair and how to measure, right? That's one of the things that you should consider. Because if you, some algo will give you 100% fill rates and some algo will give you 80% fill rates and you don't care about the um, cleanup cost or opportunity cost, the 80% fill rate will likely look better, right? So you might reach your wrong conclusions, allocate more flow to a wrong algo if you don't look at apples to apples. So I guess a lot of things we're gonna talk about here is really how to make things fair and how to make sure that you're really measuring what you should be measuring. So here, Adrian, why don't you hold this one up? So in some sense, what we have here is we have, if the total performance on what you trade is really the sum of the price times the quantity on what you executed, and then the price times the quantity on the stuff you didn't execute, right? So in some sense, if you ask me to trade something, I can't just go and not trade, not, not do what you asked me to do, because if there's some distribution and here are winners and here are losers, so if I have a distribution of things and I have ranging from winners to losers, what's the best way for me to perform well on the stuff that you measure? Don't do the losers, right? Obviously, this is what traders have it's, figured out for... It's, it's easy to have negative slippage and a 50% fill rate, right? Exactly. So you just never do... You put your, your limit price at a rival price. You never fill any of the losers, and you go and pat yourself on the back and say you're really awesome. And if somebody's not looking at the ones that you kick back, you don't know... Uh, if they're a mix of, if it's really just a normal kind of mix of winners and losers, or someone systematically poisoned that and made it so that all your bad outcomes are in the bucket where you're not being measured. So essentially, the key, key magic is, is that if you don't look at this one, if you sweep this one under the rug, then you don't know your true, true total performance because you aren't looking at the whole thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of kind of... Um, uh, in, we, were, we talked about fairness. Um, there's really, I kind of think of there as being kind of two components of fairness that are important. One being you want it to be fair, and the other one is that you want it to be predictive. Um, can you talk about how, like, how do you make things fair in a, in a comparison if you're comparing us with a bunch of other people? What's the, uh, what are some mechanisms you use to go and make sure that you don't get tricked? So there are a few things. So one is on a, there are a few things you can do on a pre-trade basis and on a post-trade basis. On a pre-trade, we're trying to do uh, allocate flow in a, as homogeneous manner as possible. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we trade 3,000 stocks, we have uh, we divide into clusters that uh, bucket stuff by difficulty of trading, say ranging from easy to trade to hard to trade, and um, then we would randomly sample from each cluster. <coughs> by stock to each broker. So pretty much to make sure if, say, Heath is entitled to get like 10% for our flow, which is 300 stocks, they will get 50 stocks from each cluster uh, that are... So later on, even though... Uh, I want to caveat one thing. So even though we can do it later on on a post-trade basis, we can just go back one year and say, hey, let us bucket it by bucket. And But things change. So market microstructure changes, uh, technology changes, volatility changes, like people change, right, uh, as well. So doing post-trade attribution just m will make it even like more noisier. So you said something there, you said, so, so essentially you're doing stratified randomization. And essentially, so random certainly makes things fair. And you're doing some stratification to go and make sure that you think that the things that you're randomizing over are kind of making it so that the, there's less likelihood of there being a kind of a bias where I get all the hard orders and someone else gets the easy ones, et cetera. Uh, if we would have like 20x flow or 20x years uh, to yeah. do that, we don't have to do it. it yeah. Noise will diversify away, right? But since if you want to measure within like a few months, yeah. and we trade a lot, so maybe even a bigger problem for Adrian in general, but we, even with our number of orders that we send, we still find it hard to make a reasonable conclusion if Remember, you don't do he this. has a short duration order, so he's uh, easier, actually, I, because he I might have more <laughs> orders per day than you, just <laughs> despite smaller notional. Yeah. No, for us, yeah, we, we, you know, there are certainly pre-trade things, and we, you know, if, if we send Heath an order for 15 minutes and then send another one for 15 minutes, it might not be to him. So we have back-to-back, -back, but then that brings in all the other biases, like we said, where 
you know, the market's reverting from our prior one, so the second player is going to look better. So for us, it, it, it is a challenge. And, you know, we, we were talking about this earlier, but there's, there's brokers that do a great job in high vol regimes. There's brokers who do a great job on low spread stocks. You know, there's always sort of the, what I call penny stocks, where you have a one cent wide spread and a massive queue. And, you know, the broker's just joining the queue and waiting there, and it's all about finding hidden liquidity and things like that. There's a, there's a wide array of different things. And so certainly we, we don't do as much around, you know, distributing pre-trade is hard because, you know, you, you say you have six buckets, but there's a lot of dimensions here over which a broker might do a, a good job or a poor job. Volatility, spread, alpha, you know, are you trading a mean reversion alpha or momentum alpha? Very different algos are going to do a good job on those. So for us, it's about postictively doing a lot of analysis to make sure that we, we equalize the type of flow that every broker got. Can I actually, when we were talking in the back, you said um, something that was quite interesting, and we actually think of things the same way. So um, actually, uh, stepping back one sec, we actually face the same problems that these guys face in our kind of building good trading engines because uh, I'm trying to go and figure out which configurations or which parameterizations are going to go and give me good performance next quarter. So these guys are going to come in and they're going to say you're, you know, good, medium, at, you know, below average. They're going to give me some ranking. In, in reality, I guess, from a post-trade perspective, it's one thing that's interesting to know the past, but really I'm trying to go and figure out what is going to give, go and give me the best chance at being successful next quarter. So we spend a lot of time going, and when, every time we make changes, we're going and carefully going and assessing them to go and make sure that they're actually adding positive value not or you know not going and taking a subtle step backwards it's very easy to go and make something that sounds like a good idea actually perform worse so so we do a lot of self assessments one thing that we found quite interesting i have one, my stats guy that works for me. He's really, he came from a medical background, so he just said, when he first came to finance, he said, how comes people don't go and pre-state their intentions? You know, every proper medicine person has, you know, if, they're, if you're running a test on a cancer drug, you don't go and just say, oh, I'll just run it until I get a 2T stat. That's how you p-value hack. <laughs> so, what, you know, what you do is you go and say, oh, I know the, di you know, the expected difference between what I'm measuring, what I'm, this change that I'm about to put out is half a basis point. So now, you have to go and ask yourself the question, well, how much flow do I need in order to go and measure half a basis point? And then that's going to go and ask you another question that, or force you to kind of think about another question. Then you're going to say, well, how much variability do I have per order? And then that, you know, and, the, and how many orders do I need to diversify away? So let's say if I'm trading orders over a day, you know, you have, let's say, stock prices move around plus or minus 200 basis points in a day, right? Typical 2% move. So if you're averaging into it, you get about, roughly speaking, plus or minus 100 bips. So if you want to go and make that thing smaller, if you want to diversify away that plus or minus 100 bips per order to be less than the half basis, basis point that you're measuring, you, that you think your effect is, you have to have 40,000 orders. And then, of course, it's, you know, it can be more, uh, you know, a higher bar than that because not all those orders are equally important. You have some big orders, they're very important to you. You have some small orders, they're not so important to you. So you actually need 40,000 similar sized orders to go and me measure this effect. So, but you know, if you're if you want to go and be a professional, it makes sense. You know, you have to go and pre-state these. You know, what you're looking for, so that you kind of know upfront. You know, whether or not the results that you're looking at are likely to be predictive, or if you've just kind of happened to be found the one in twenty. Like if I if I have fifty tests going on to go and test different configurations, I'm going to have a couple of them that are going to be false positives. If I'm looking for a one in twenty, you know value so you know I think that's something that is very important is kind of thinking up front as to what you're looking for so that you kind of understand and you know it's, you can, it's these are very basic diversification like this is just very very basic volatility model anybody who has run an investment portfolio understands kind of diversification but then people seem to forget about it when they go into the trading world so is there, do you have anything to kind of add to that or did I steal all our conversation from the back <laughs> No, I, I mean, it, it, it is a big problem. And w one of the things is that, you know, especially coming from the world of alpha, which is an incredibly, incredibly low signal to noise problem, overfitting is, is, you know, is an art form, right? It's incredibly easy to do. It happens to everybody. Um, you know, I, I think from my lifetime in this industry, I would say that 90% of strategies that go live get turned off, but every one of them looked good in a back test. That's why you turned it on. And so, um, in, in, in back to, you know, depending on the type of signal, you can be a little more rigorous or a little bit better about it. But yeah, you need, and you know, this is one of the things that I know you always, you, that, that you do a great job of is, you know, A-B testing, 
really getting statistical certainty that changes make sense. You know, you have to you have to view them through the lens of different volatility. You have to view them through the lens of you know different regimes that might be happening. You could test something over two months, and those two months are you know right after the election or right after Brexit or something like that, and it looks fantastic. And for the next two years, it's going to underperform. So it's uh, you know it, it's 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 a real challenge, and and continuous A/B testing and rigorous statistics is the only way I know of to fix it. Yeah, we've kind of gone towards. Um doing continuous, like, so you have a trade-off. So obviously the, the thing that will go and give you the most measurement precision is if you have the same amount of diversification on both sides, i.e. a 50-50 test, because then both sides have as much diversification as possible and their error bars, are, their standard error is going to be as small as possible. But the problem is, is that, you know, if you have a thing that's good and you go and say, oh, well, this thing's really good, you know, what do you want to do? You want to then do more of it. So let's say you want to be 80-20. The problem is, is now the side that's 20 is going to be noisier, and so sometimes it's going to look like it's better and stuff like that. So uh, certainly, you you know, again, going into these kind of decisions, you know, eyes open and understanding what you're looking at and how much noise you expect to be in there, so that you can go and draw these interpretations. It really is actually you're making predictions like like you would in an alpha model. You're going in this, these interpretations rely on all the same concepts that you have when you're building alpha. And it's the exact same decision we face deciding which broker to route to. Yeah. Right, just like you're deciding where to post liquidity, you know, where to post an order, we're deciding which broker to send it to, and it is the same problem, and it varies by regime and everything else. So the question, actually, um, maybe in general to Heathrow agent, right? Can you predict the regime, right? So if you have one configuration that works in low wall, and one configuration works well in high wall, right? And now markets start to be choppy, right? So is it more like a human decision or it's in, you know, model can pretty much say market will be choppy next three months, so let's move into high wall setting, right? Is something that you guys decide when you build Algus, right? Yeah, I guess we're, well, so, you know, we're, we really think, I really end up having, you know, remember if you go to the beginning slide, I said that it, to get the best average price, it's going to be based on your view of where prices are going and how much you think you'll change them. So in reality, we have a bunch of people you know, trying to go and make predictions over what we think is where, where prices are going to go over the duration that people give us to trade. So like most people give us, you know, let's say the average duration of an order is going to be something like you know, three and a half hours or something like that. So we kind of ours, we make a lot of predictions on ranging from like milliseconds through you know, ne next day's average price. The next day's average price is maybe useful. Someone says, you don't have to trade the close. You can kind of trade it tomorrow if you think that tomorrow is going to be better prices than the close. So, so we spend a bunch of time on prediction, and then we spend a bunch of time on looking at the feedback about how, when we trade, how that affects the world. Really, it's a, a study in supply-demand imbalance. And actually, we're kind of in a lucky position uh, to be able to go and I, I know that you guys are kind of jealous of our ability to go and poke the world in different ways because when we trade as a, on a, as a sell side person, you know, we have a bunch of people that are trading you know, passively over the day. We have some people that are trading big, meaty orders that are like 10% of the day's volume, like so really heavy, heavy handed things. We have people that are trading this point in time, they're just trading like very aggressively 50% of the interval volume for five seconds or five, five minutes. Uh, so we exercise the world in a lot of different ways and that allows us to go and build models of how that feedback loop um, kind of uh, operate so that that supply demand Im imbalance kind of behavior. So I think that's really, so we spend our time kind of trying to predict those two things. So, so it is trying to predict it in the context of what we see in the marketplace right now. Um, actually, the, you, you alluded to one thing there, Adrian, where, and you know, what happens when you go and decide that you're going to change some weight? So let's say you thought that, you know, there, there's two algos and, you know, they, they're kind of interesting and then at, you know, and then one of the, but one of them outperforms the other. So then you go and size up that algo. So you go, you're 50, 50. Uh, so I was, I was going to go and try and do some live math. If, if you guys remember Simpson's paradox, right? So you can have a baseball player. Let's pretend Constantine's a baseball player and Adrian's a baseball player. And Constantine is a better baseball player than Adrian. You know, so they're both in the minors. He bats, you know, uh, 350. He bats 325. Um, and then, you know, and then they get promoted to the majors. Uh, you know, uh, Constantine bats 250 or 275. He bats 250. So each time he's batted 25 points higher than Adrian. 
but it is possible for Constantine to have a career average that's worse than Adrian. How is that possible? It's possible if he had way more at bats the second year, you know, when, when the batting averages across the league were lower because, you know, they stopped the pitcher rules changed or something like that. So it's, it, you know, so that's a thing that you face if you do active management, you have to go and think about how are you going to go and not get tricked. Like, so let's pretend that Constantine is truly every year in the future, he, he's going to be a better baseball player, but you don't see that in the data that you're looking at. So how can you go and so there's some tricks that you can use to go and try to mitigate this. Can you, you guys want to talk about how, how you can uh, make sure you don't get tricked by Simpsons bias? Sure. I mean, if you were to calculate the average cost we've paid to each broker over time, that's not meaningful, right? The brokers we were using during volatility in February this year or fourth quarter last year, right, caused massively higher T costs. And so whoever was getting the bulk of our flow then looks much worse on a long-term cost analysis, uh, which, is, which is exactly this problem. Yeah. So, so for us, it's a matter of um, there, there's two ways you can solve it. One is you can do it, you can, you can value it versus a predictive model. So you can say, okay, based on volatility and other conditions, we predicted we would pay three and a half basis points for all the orders we sent to Heath, and we paid four and a half, so he's missing by a basis point, which, which Heath would never do, but in, in theory. Um, whereas other brokers, you know, maybe their average cost should have been two and a half, and they're performing at three bips. So they're, they're, they have the same level of performance, yeah. but the overall number looks better. That, that, that's a pretty useful technique for us. Yeah. So we do a few things. So one is definitely um, looking at the, doing some kind of alpha adjustments or even like um, impact adjustments as well, just to make sure that, again, in the high wall, it's expected. So it's all kind of relative. It's not absolute performance. Mm -hmm. Also, we rank brokers not by BIPs, but literally by the absolute perf performance. So whether they all get bad, but some will get worse, right? And uh, we try not to do very active management. So if some broker gets 20% and our model says that he isn't, should get 5%. You say, prove it again. Is that, that's <clears> what I'm used to hearing. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> more, more or less. No, we will just very gradually, yep. we'll yep. just go to 15 and yep. then maybe to 12, to 10, right? And uh, if you improve, it will go back up because this yep. metrics are noisy, right? Yep. So we're not trying to flip too much weight. Yeah. So actually one thing that's interesting about if you go and do a, uh, a model-based thing, so I guess one, the, one of the ways that we take care of this is we go, because let's say if we find some configuration that we think wins, then we go and want to upweight that, but then if, well, let's say, if Trump tar starts tweeting or they, you know, China and US start fighting or whatever, then you know, costs in the, mar model, in the market go up, but I just went and started allocating more to the thing that's, you know, that I think is better. So it's gonna, you know, long run, if I just look at a straight, kind of average, it's gonna look worse. So one way that we kind of deal with this is we'll go and uh, kind of reweight things as to go and make sure they have equal kind of relative weights through time. That's one way to go and take out that bias. Um, if you work relative to a model, I guess, um, uh, talk, this is a kind of flipping to like impact cost model. So if I go and say, I'm having more costs than I expected, there is a possibility that my cost model is wrong. So if I go and see that there's a gap from something, there's the, there either there's you know relative out or under performance to the model, or the model itself is biased. Uh, so anytime you go and work relative to a model, I guess what we do is we go and spend a bunch of time trying to convince ourselves that the model isn't biased because any, you know you know working relative to a model is a good way to go and introduce a bias if the the you know the thing that you're if that benchmark is biased. So the reweighting the. Uh, weight is important. So one thing that we do, even though, let's say we have two brokers, we send them a lot of flow. Yeah. Um, on average, you might argue that all the noise will divers be diversified away, but if some broker gets slightly luckier, and slightly doesn't mean it has to be a lot, right? Some gets like 55% of orders that run away from you, and other brokers will get 45% of orders that come, you know, run away from you. This like 5% or 10% can introduce big bias in general, right? Mm -hmm. So luck can be still there as a factor. So what we tend to do is maybe break the conditions into so-called favorable, unfavorable, and do kind of equal weighted in each, as opposed to notional weighted in each, because it, this 5% can be a big difference. But all those, you have to be very careful, because there's an endogenate. Anytime you go and include anything that happened at the same time you're trading, you become blind to your own impact. So I guess that's the, actually, I'll, I'll make a little, what, my last slide will be kind of the, um, you know, uh, kind of illustrating that point. 
be, well, because this is a modern conference, wouldn't be a modern conference if we didn't say something about AI. And since you have taught at various uh, universities and stuff like that about um, AI, do you think that this is, um, do you envision these techniques having kind of a role in this type of thing? Or like everything I just talked about is obviously very classic stats kind of approach. Um, what's, what's your thoughts on AI in this uh, space? Yeah, I think it's everybody has a different definition of what is AI or ML to start with. Well, let me say AI is, <laughs> let me narrow it down to say it's if you let, if you delegate the functional form to the machine. So if, like if, if you hard, you know. If, if you delegate the functional form to the machine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I would say in terms of forecasting T costs, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, AI and ML are very good at understanding how much it's going to cost to trade an order. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I think I, I've seen success there personally. I know there are papers talking about it. There, there's a fair amount out there about the success of it for forecasting. Uh, de depending on if you want to dictate something like reinforcement learning and things like that, in terms of broker algo selection, reinforcement learning is a big technique. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you, you can think of it, uh, I, w w without going into specifics of what we do, there are people who look at it during the day and say, oh, I need to try sending an order to JP Morgan because I might be getting great performance from them today because they have an internal liquidity pool or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, I, 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 depending on which reinforcement learning algo that might or might not be the machine dictating the functional form, but I think that's a big, a big area for people. Let me go and just, uh, we have about five minutes left, so let me go and just um, uh, do one interesting thing. So, okay, so you're, uh, that's what you, and then P naught. So we, here we're, we're back to kind of our, what happens if, I'm, what I wanted to go and talk about is, okay, so I'm, I'm talking to two people that are actually on the lucky end of the stick here because they're people that go and have lots of orders and can go and measure relatively precise things in finite time. But there's a bunch of people that don't have the luxury of this, uh, of that many orders. So here I have execution price minus p naught. So what I've done here, this is just, you know, your good old arrival price. There's a bunch of people who, uh, you know, care about a basis point just as much as you guys, but then they don't have as many orders. And they, for the reason, they may actually trade, you know, as much notional as you guys because they might go and trade a few big lumpy orders. So they trade just as much notional. So they care about a BIP because it's the same number of dollars out of their pocket, but the problem is, is that they get no diversification so they can't measure anything. And the problem with this measure is this is very noisy because over the life of time that you're trading, a lot of random things happen to you. So, okay, so I'm a mathematician, so I don't know if you guys remember, what do mathematicians do? They do, um, they do tricks, you know, so here, okay, so here, here's plus V1, well, that goes down to him. Okay, so let's say here, so now I've done nothing. So here, oh, no, you got to flip it around there. So it's supposed to go PX minus IV up plus IV up. So what have I done? I've done nothing. I've just added and subtracted the same thing, right? This is like this is what mathematicians do, and then they think they're clever. Uh, so I, but it, it, so the whole thing is still just the arrival price performance. But if I go if, now, if you come a little bit over here, this here is your performance relative to IV up. And that's how much you impacted the VWAP price with your trading relative to rival price. So if you go and, and the whole thing is your rival price measure. So let's say if you ignore Adrian, so you say, you know, you're going to ignore the impact that you have on the benchmark, your rival price performance is then, if, if there's no impact on the, let me say that differently, if there's no impact on the benchmark, then your rival price performance is the same as your VWAP slippage. This thing here is a lot less noisy. Why is it less noisy? Because the same random things that are happening to your order in the marketplace are happening to this benchmark. So this thing here is like 10 times less noisy, which means you need like 100 times less orders, right? So this thing here, way easier to measure. You know, if you needed 40,000 orders before, now you only need 4,000. Maybe it's maybe this is actually tractable, or 400. Now this is maybe pretty tractable. The problem is, is that you're not look, paying attention for Adrian over there, and maybe you're having a bunch of impact on the benchmark, right? And, but, and if you go and use a VWAP measure, you're blind to that because you, you're, you know, you don't, you're not looking at that thing, and you're hoping that this is the same as the arrival price. So sometimes it's quite interesting to go and b look at these kind of telescoping forms, uh, and you, there's lots of different ways that you can kind of add and subtract the same thing and do kind of focus your attention on different aspects of the trading problem. So this is a common technique that people that don't have enough orders, uh, they can go and kind of get things that are measurable, 
but you have to go and go in with eyes aware. You have to go and be aware that you're now not, you've kind of slipped that thing under the rug and you're not able to go and see that. Um, so I guess that's really, so, you know, we'll leave a couple seconds for questions and stuff like that. I just wanted to go and point out that essentially when we're doing, when we're trying to assess trading performance, um, you know, we, we believe that the thing that you should care about in summary is dollars out of pocket. Dollars out of pocket is closest to an arrival price performance. If you, if a person has the discretion to underfill, so Adrian may not, may be willing to go and let us underfill some orders because I don't, he says, I don't want to trade if you're going to go and just cross the spread for no good reason. He may be willing to leave some underfills, but if he does that, he has to go and look at the performance on the underfills so that I don't have a, a rug to go and sleep bad, uh, slip bad performance underneath. Then when you're going and assessing, you know, comparing brokers, you're comparing me versus someone else, et cetera. Then what you need to do is you need to kind of make sure it's fair and it's predictive. So you make it fair by doing random assignment. You know, I can't go and say that you bias things against me if it's randomly assigned because random equals random. It's not, it's by definition it's fair. But what it might not be is it might not be predictive if you've only sent me a few hundred orders and, you know, after a few hundred orders, the error bars or the kind of diversification of the volatility is still plus or minus like five bips. And if, the, if I think the difference between a really good algo and a bad algo is, let's say, a basis point, uh, or maybe that's, that's a good versus an average algo, if I think the difference between those is a basis point and you only have plus or minus four bips worth of error bars, you can't tell that and you're going to go and kind of kind of have random conclusions. So. Uh, I guess what we wanted to do is just kind of make sure that these things are kind of on the tips of your of your brain as you're kind of thinking about these things. And you know, it's it is a science. It's not like you know, it's it's stats, I guess. Um, and so uh, you know, th these are not things that are mystery. You may not like the outcome. You may not you know you may not like hearing that you need 40,000 orders to go and measure a subtle thing. Uh, but the reality is that that's how diversification works. So I want to thank you guys for going and you know volunteering some time to go and talk about this stuff with me and. We're happy to take a, a question or two from the audience. It sounded like a lot of it is based on the past and trying to measure it in all kinds of different ways. Are you using simulations of the future? Well, so... Uh, so the other guys, too, all of, all of you. Yeah, so actually, you guys go first. Do you guys... Uh, I mean, in, in terms of transaction costs, for us, we, we largely look at historical, um, you know, modeling individual orders. I, I've written my own algos elsewhere, I, and I, you know, I don't know Heath's thoughts on it, but it's not, the, the problem with, with that is that you're a significant component of the market, you interact with it a lot, you move the market, you impact the market, you know, you take out some hidden liquidity or there's hidden liquidity there you don't know about in a back test. It's very hard and live A-B testing I think is more effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the way that we think of it is that the, it's, you know, a simulation is not very well suited to go and give, to, to test what we're trying to measure here. Here we're trying to go and see how, do, how does my trading activity change the marketplace and how does the world react to me. By definition, you can have impact cost models put into a simulator, but then the simulator will just spit out whatever your assumptions are that you put in for those impact cost models. So, so we use simulation very heavily when trying to go and invent new algorithms, but when we want to go and assess them, we use the, essentially the truth of the real world. You go and have to go and try and see if it actually works better or not, and, and then we're kind of thinking about statistically how many orders do I need to go and uh, draw that conclusion. So yeah, I would echo what uh, he th said. So basically what we do, we can go back in history, we can unimpact all the prices, we can re-impact them again with maybe saying, oh, I, if what would have happened if I traded 2x today, right? So we do this, but it will be as good as your um, impact model. And one of the challenges, actually maybe a little bit less for you, but a little bit more for us, is uh, to segregate impact and alpha, <coughs> uh, right? So while maybe for you, we have different uh, clients, different horizons, it might be a little bit easier, to make some assumptions, while for us it's not. So going back in history, even if you have very good impact model, um, to change your alpha assumptions might be a little bit difficult. What would have happened like three years ago? Yeah. Uh, what is the typical time frame of the, the trades or the, the types of trade execution? Uh, question so one and question two is, are you generally more interested in, in very short? 
time frames or in longer time frames where you have more room to maneuver depending on your outlook or, or your certainty of the, out the outlook? I guess, um, you know, so, you know, we will have people that will just go and rent our pipes and we'll be looking to get to market in, you know, a sub microsecond and stuff like that. So there are people like that. In my world, like my job is, is building the algorithm. So in the algo space, um, uh, people are typically delegating about three and a half hours of discretion, but the shortest time frames would be several minutes typically, and the longest ones would be all day or even some, some multi-day orders. So uh, with an average being around three and a half hours. So that's kind of the typical duration that we have in, in our algo plant. Actually, that one point that you said about alpha versus impact is a very interesting thing because, okay, so we spend a lot of time trying to make impact cost models. I was j joking with Kevin, uh, my stats friend, and we were talking about how we must have spent, you know, 10% of our of our careers thinking about, uh, you know, impact cost models, which is uh, seems interesting and depressing at the same time. Um, the so we 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 put we it's unbiased across many dimensions. If I go and bin plot this thing across size, speed, spread, volatility, time of day, repeat orders, you know, futures, ADRs, you know, all kinds of things. I've, so we you know we think that we have a very good model that's unbiased across lots of dimensions, but. I go and show. I go and apply it to one person, and they consistently always get 30% lower than my impact cost model estimates. Uh, even though, for some reason, when I've been plotted across all these other dimensions, it's always fine. This one person has always found the times when it's easy, and another person has always found times when it's like they're 10% harder than our impact cost model. And what what is that? That's because we purposely have tried to disentangle those things. So, the the first person, the one that's easy, they actually tend to be contrary. So they they're people that but the prices fall, they go and send a bunch of offsetting orders. So by definition, those, those orders are actually pretty easy for us to complete, and we always go and get better performance than we kind of than the plant-wide average. So it's actually quite a you know, the reason why we try to disentangle them and not kind of describe them together is because when I see that, then I want to go and know that, oh, this, this is a contrarian person. This is a person who happens to have impact, is kind of trading at times that are easier. Maybe it's better to go and backload those orders. It gives me other ideas as to how I should trade those things. So we purposely want to keep those two things separate. And, and you have this situation where you have clients with many different levels of alpha, right? Yeah. You have clients who think prices are going to move in five minutes, and you have pr clients who are doing a sector portfolio rotation over three days, setting them up for the next six months. So Correct, yeah. Yeah, so that, so that gives us a nice kind of rich universe to kind of try to find the middle, I guess, the true middle. Yeah. Any more? Cool. Well, thank you very much, guys, for the attention, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you.